Today on Missing Link. What does Mount Vesuvius have to do with crude oil in Germany? Where's the connection between crude oil and whales in the ocean? And what is it that binds whales and sleep? Why is a German mountain associated with sleep? There aren't any links? Oh yes, there are. You just need to look really hard. Missing Link. Italy's largest port city, an important commercial center and a popular tourist destination for people across the globe, Naples. Ferry boats to the holiday islands of Capri and Ischia set out from here, and every day cruise ships moor at its terminals. To tourists, it's the most Italian of cities. Statistically, Naples is one of the world's most densely populated cities, where over a million people live in a very cramped space. It houses four times as many people per square kilometer as Rome, and this is palpable everywhere in the city. What's more, each morning thousands of commuters stream into this metropolis at the foot of the active volcano Vesuvius. Our planet is a living entity. Over the billions of years of its existence, it's been in a state of constant flux, changing according to its own laws. Yet mankind has shaped the Earth too, building huge settlements, megacities scattered across the entire globe. Their lights are visible from space. Our planet is now more densely populated than ever. Does that mean catastrophe is more probable than ever? One of these urban centers is located on the Gulf of Naples. A bird's eye view shows just how densely populated it is. But it isn't until you delve into this sea of concrete that you truly realize how rapidly this city has grown. It is a potpourri of 19th century facades alongside medieval and modern structures. The history of this settlement goes back to antiquity. Since then, the city has continued to expand to this day. Its population keeps growing. Naples is one of the few cities in Europe with a birth surplus. Yet Mount Vesuvius looms over its inhabitants, threatening their futures like the sword of Damocles. Their city's location, next to one of the most active volcanoes in the world, puts its very existence in the balance. Here's a scenario that may loom if Vesuvius does erupt. Naples buried almost entirely under a mass of molten rock. And that's not all. Days or weeks on end of smeary grey rainfall would then ensue, making it difficult for people across Central Europe, from southern Italy to north of the Alps, to breathe. The global climate would be altered for years. Is this realistic or merely a doomsday scenario? Our planet is made of a series of layers and gets hotter and hotter towards its core. The continents are part of the Earth's outer layer or mantle, which is relatively rigid. This shell has broken up into plates over geological time. These plates are constantly moving and grind against one another. Today, research satellites can precisely measure their movements. They provide exact figures. The African and Eurasian plates are colliding at a rate of two centimeters per year. The crumple zone runs through the Mediterranean. The plates overlap and jam up against one another. This causes a tremendous amount of stress the sudden release of this stress causes earthquakes. One of these tectonic seams runs straight down Italy, and Naples lies right on it. And that's what makes this region ripe for geological disaster. Volcanoes are formed as magma pushes up along plate boundaries and flows onto the Earth's surface. This is how Vesuvius came to be. The explosive activity going on inside it makes it a serious threat. But the real problem is the sea of residential buildings at its foot. 
Nowhere else in the world is a city of a million inhabitants located in such close proximity to a volcano. The ground under us holds many secrets. Even Germany has crude oil deposits. To find them, we must drill deep into the earth. But what do crude oil and its extraction in Germany have to do with Mount Vesuvius? The beginning of history is now just a few days old. Well, actually about a hundred million years. At that time, the African continental plate with unimaginable force collided with Europe. In the resulting crumple zone, the Alps were formed. And more than that, there was also collateral damage. From the Southern Alps down to Sicily, the Earth's crust was ruptured. Liquid rock or magma spurted out of the Earth, forming a row of volcanoes, and one of them was Vesuvius. To the north, though, the new Alps, through their enormous weight, caused the ground to sink, so deep that the boggy woodland there became buried under the alpine rocks, where it slowly evolved into oil. The forming of Vesuvius and the forming of oil in Germany are the result of one of the biggest pileups ever to take place on Earth. Crude oil is extracted from about 50 different oil fields in Germany. They yield 3.5 million tonnes of oil annually. The amount in them varies. This valuable commodity is hidden away at a depth of between 1,000 and 2,500 metres. The search for undiscovered deposits is extremely laborious and is pursued non-stop. Breitz near Kiel, Germany, a team of geologists arrives with heavy machinery. They're pinning their hopes on finding new and profitable oil reserves in the state of Schleswig-Holstein, oil that it would own and have the pumping rights to. Seismologists shake the earth with seismic surveyor trucks. The survey is expensive and risky, as it's believed that most of the existing onshore deposits in Germany have already been discovered and exhausted. But experts believe there is still exploitable oil in smaller fault blocks. These reserves may be Germany's last. The vibrating trucks send seismic waves that penetrate thousands of meters below the Earth's surface and are reflected off layers of rock. These vibrations are recorded with geophones, which are basically sonic depth sounders for the Earth. Over 40,000 geophones are in place in the area that's being surveyed. The data are sent directly to a control van. Geologist Michel Hoyer coordinates the readings. He and his international team of seismologists compiled 3D maps of the bedrock in a very familiar area. In the last century, we exhausted a number of oil fields in this area between the towns of Bretz and Plön. We're now taking readings over a 400 square kilometer area, as we believe that there could be more deposits near the old deposits that have yet to be discovered. And we'd be quite happy if these fields had a volume of between one and one and a half million cubic meters. Today, High demand and increasing oil prices have made even oil fields that were once considered unprofitable attractive. The oil hunters use a variety of methods to acquire conclusive diagnostic data, including underground blasts. The ignition cable is let out and the blasting charge deposited at a depth of up to 24 meters. Explosives experts must follow strict safety regulations and cannot set off blasts within 250 metres of residential buildings. Blasting points are marked with brightly coloured sticks. This is important as the sheer size of area means that days can pass between preparations and the actual explosion. Finally, the blasting team prepares to ignite the explosive. First, electric current must be sent through the ignition cable. The team in the control van coordinates the entire operation. The blast, which can hardly be felt above ground, is set off with a mouse click. It was a success, even if the significant tremors it caused were hardly perceivable. 
The substratum of the eastern part of Holstein is rattled by up to 200 such pressure pulses each day. The data that's gathered is used to create elaborate 3D models. The graphic renderings of the subsurface assist the geologists in their search for potential oil stores in the rock. Yet to be absolutely certain, they must drill. That, however, is still a long way off. Whales swim halfway across the globe in search of food. But what is the link between whales and the search for crude oil? To keep the pangs of hunger at bay, a whale needs to take in several tons of feed. Most of it is made up of little shrimps or krill. But this presents the whale with a bit of a problem, because in the dark of the depths he can't see his would-be meal. So that he needn't starve, the whale has developed a special way of hearing, bioecho, or biosonar. The whale gives off acoustic signals, or clicks, which get reflected off the little crabs swimming around in the water. The reflected sound reaches the whale, where they get focused. This is done with an acoustic lens, located in the whale's head. It's called the melon, from where it gets sent straight to the ear. So, Whales find their food with the same technology used by others to locate oil. Hmm, to each of their own. Although no one knows exactly what draws them to the Azores archipelago, there's a good chance of seeing them here. The largest mammals in the world, blue whales. According to marine biologist Rui Prieto, it's the ideal place to conduct whale research. We do think that the azers play a role on their migration, either as a landmark, uh, something that they, they can use to, to know where they are going and where they, they have to turn, uh, either to the right or to the left. I don't know how they do that. Or we think that uh, this might be one of the first places they find krill to feed on. And we do see the blue whales feeding here. Just before they move on with their migration, they stop here and have some snack. Why do these whales make a pit stop in the Azores? The answer lies under the ocean. These nine islands in the middle of the Atlantic are the tips of a towering mountain range that begins thousands of meters below the water's surface. Around them, Powerful deep-sea currents flow through the North Atlantic, carrying masses of warm and cold water across the ocean. When these currents hit the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, this formidable deep-sea mountain range sends masses of cold, nutrient-rich water upwards. Near the Azores, the flow of water nearly reaches the surface and sustains a range of organisms. This is the only reason vast quantities of krill can be found here. The whales won't feast again until they've reached the polar seas. The whales can eat all they want in the Azores, providing the whale researchers with a unique opportunity. They can tag the animals with transmitters that allow them to secretly monitor their migration paths. Finally, a colleague reports a blue whale sighting. In the search area, they must keep their eyes and ears open. Normally, blue whales surface every two minutes, but sometimes it can take up to 20. A long-awaited noise. The blow of a blue whale just a few hundred meters away. It's time to move. They must quickly remove the transmitter from its sterile packaging and mount it on a special projectile. If they're successful, Mr. Prieto will be able to locate and track this whale on its migratory path across the globe. The boat must be stable, and the whale must be swimming at a specific angle to the boat to get a perfect shot. Otherwise, it will be impossible for the researcher to get the transmitter into the desired spot, just a few centimeters behind the dorsal fin. 
He's been waiting for this moment for months. The transmitter will only work if the strike is successful. Certainty comes hours later. Rui Prieto and his colleagues receive the first data transmissions from the transmitter. That's reason enough to christen the whale Freud after the great Austrian psychoanalyst. Congratulations, Freud, the blue whale. Rui Prieto combines the position data he gets from Freud with other measured values, like surface water temperature. Other researchers also enter data into this virtual whale migration atlas. The data is accurate to within a few hundred meters. What influences their migratory routes? Do they intentionally search out colder regions with nutrient-rich water and large quantities of krill? For most species, the migration routes are not known in any way. So we do know where they go when they, they go to, to feed, but we don't know uh, how they get there and how they choose the areas, the feeding areas. With the satellite tags, we can follow them and start understanding what makes an area important for them. And that could be used uh, to uh, understand how our human impacts can affect the whales. Maybe Freud the blue whale will make a small contribution to securing the long-term survival of the last of the blue whales. Every night, we spend a number of hours in a state of extremely relaxed tranquility. We sleep. Sleep is vital to our lives, as too little sleep makes us ill. But what link is there between our sleeping habits and whales? Dolphins and other larger types of whale have a brilliant way of sleeping. They sleep with only one half of their brain. The other remains guarding, on watch. And after two hours, they change sides, making sure of fair play. Sperm whales, though, do things differently. They sleep for up to one hour, 40 minutes with both sides of their brain. During this time, they either bob up and down on the surface or remain above 10 meters depth. This makes the sperm whale the undisputed champion of non-sleepers. No other mammal sleeps less. Such a sleep pattern probably makes top managers very jealous because their workday would be lengthened by six hours. An adult human needs a daily average of six to eight hours sleep, which put into perspective means we sleep through one third of our lives. Oh well, night night. Throughout Europe, universities and specialists are conducting a long-term study called EU Clock. Chronobiologists have discovered that we have altered our daily rhythms so that we get too little light during the day and too much light at night. Artificial light has revolutionized how we live. Not too long ago, people went to sleep shortly after sunset. Now we ourselves can determine when we want our day to start and end. This leads to illness and an increase in apparently inexplicable disasters. People become mistake prone and our hormones go haywire. Scientists have proved this. A tireless Swiss man is one of them. Christian Gajochen, director of the Center for Chronobiology at the University of Basel Hospital. We human beings are a diurnal species. This means we're meant to sleep or rest at night and not expose ourselves to light. Kajochen's experiments show that artificial light throws our biological rhythms off kilter, dangerously changing the time on our internal clocks. Sleep researchers are conducting these experiments in the hope of discovering how these changed living conditions affect our health. The test subjects come to our biology lab where we have very controlled conditions. They lie down in a bed and are shielded from external stimuli such as light and social time markers. They receive no information regarding the passing of time in the outside world. This is essential, for instance, to measure brain waves in a controlled environment during waking and sleep. 
And the aim is then to use specific types of light application, that is, light at daytime and at night, to see what effects this has on sleep and the internal clock. By systematically turning light on and off, the researchers can manipulate a subject's internal clock. Primarily, we need light to be able to see, to allow us to see our surroundings and to visualize things. We don't consciously realize just how light affects our circadian clock. There are very specialized cells in the eyes that even continue to function in certain blind people who have no conscious perception of light, yet can still register light around them. This is very important because it lets the body know whether it's day or night. It's essentially relaying the external time to the body's internal clock. Technological advances have created a world where humans are exposed to too much light at night. And we all have our own innate predispositions. Sleep researchers differentiate between night owls and early birds, between people who sleep late and early risers. Human circadian rhythms originate in the brain. We even know exactly where our internal clock is located, about two to three centimeters behind the bridge of the nose. It keeps things synchronized, much like a pacemaker, except it regulates the rhythm of our 24-hour clock. The circadian rhythm is a cycle of physiological processes over an entire day. This internal clock is cued by sunlight exposure and is actually ingrained in most living creatures' DNA. Researchers using an electroencephalogram to decipher what's going on in the brain. However, artificial light also influences hormone levels. Researchers in the USA found that ignoring our circadian rhythms can raise the risk of cancer. The World Health Organization has confirmed these findings. One in five employees in Europe does shift work, and that number is growing. Everything around us is open around the clock. We try to outsmart nature with artificial light, forgetting that we are bound to it. The Kiffhäuser Hills are right in front of our nose. This range of hills is steeped in legend and mystery. But what's the link between the Kiffhäuser Hills and sleep? If we're to believe written history, then Kaiser Friedrich I, also known as Barbarossa, drowned on his way to a crusade. One legend dismisses this, claiming that the head of the Holy Roman Empire is not dead, but asleep in a cave in Kiffhäuser, central Germany. Some visitors claim to have heard him snoring, his red beard continuing to grow, hanging over the edge of a stone table at which he's seated. At some point, when his kingdom needs him, he will awaken from his slumber and sort everything out. A flock of ravens circling the mountain is said to be his alarm clock. The legend of Barbarossa was very popular in the 19th century. Many cherished the idea of a united German state. In 1871, that idea became reality. But through it all, Barbarossa still managed to doze. An expedition into the Kiffhäuser Hills. Diethard Walter, an archaeologist from Weimar, Germany, is following in the footsteps of a famous anthropologist. During a dig here 60 years ago, Professor Bame Blanca found thousands of human bones. According to his notes, they had been cut up, roasted, and had had the marrow sucked out of them. His conclusion, these people were cannibals. Yet his theory has repeatedly been challenged. Time for a scientific examination into the matter. With the help of old excavation maps, Walter sets out to locate the cannibal cave described by Bim Blanca. The Kiffhäuser range is full of mystery. A vast maze of caves is hidden within these hills. Some of these caves are connected, others are merely dead ends, and some are as yet uncharted. 
Ben Blanca presented a range of evidence to support his theory of a cannibal cult. His proof is now being reviewed using modern-day scientific methods. The scene of the crime 3,000 years ago. The Kiffhäuser Hills, southeast of the Hartz Mountains. As the age-old tales of a hidden underworld here would have it, the legendary Holy Roman Emperor Barbarossa slumbers in a cave here. Thousands of human bones from about 100 people that show clear signs of violent treatment. Animals could not have done this, as the cut and burn marks are too conspicuous. Archaeological experiments on animal bones using exact replicas of prehistoric tools are the speciality of physicist Tim Schuler. What do the marks on the bones reveal about the weapons used? Flintstone dulls quickly. The cuts were probably made with bronze knives. An extremely sharp blade, it's typical. The great number of cuts on the ends of the joints on the bones from the Kiffhäuser cave is striking and it gives Dr. Schuler an idea. He examines a ham hock. I got this stripped bone from the butchers. As you see, the cut marks are in the same spots as the cut marks on the bones from the Kaffhäuser caves. That means human and animal bones had their flesh scraped off, right where the muscles attach. If our early relatives carved up and roasted people, as the burn marks suggest, it was probably in the context of sacrificial rituals. That probably included cannibalism. To be certain, the archaeologists take their bone artefacts to Jena to examine them under the microscope. A key detail is verified. Here we can see the lime deposits in the incision very clearly. This proves the marks weren't caused by excavator spades, but do indeed stem from long, long ago. The lime deposits have built up over centuries. As we can see from the experiment with the animal bone here, the blow from the blade of the axe left very similar markings. That's exactly what Bain Blanca said back in the 1950s, just that he couldn't look at it through a high-powered microscope. Whatever it was that took place 3,000 years ago, the evidence proves this. People butchered people in the Kiffhäuser Hills with knives and axes and then roasted them on open fires as part of an ancient ritual of ancestor worship.